you have your scriptures this morning, you want to turn with me to the book of John. Uh, we'll be using the verse that uh, Travis read for us this morning, John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12, as we continue in our uh, sermon series on the I Am sayings of Jesus. And before we go to that verse and, and read it again for, to gain a little more familiarity uh, with it, I... Uh, as I was preparing this sermon, I, I came up with a question that I couldn't answer, so I thought I'd um, ask some of you and see if you know the answer to it, and that is simply this. How would we define darkness if we didn't know about light? How could you possibly define darkness if you didn't know something about light? Now, one of my favorite quotes about darkness came from the great theologian Robert Redford in his movie, The Natural, when he comments to uh, the, the team owner uh, that he played for, played ball for, he said, the only thing I know about, or the, there's only one thing I know about the dark, and that is that you can't see in it. Light, how do you, how do you define it? Well, we would say that it illuminates stuff, and so that's how we would define it, pretty much. But I looked it up. A technical definition, or the, or the dictionary de- definition, says light is the electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength that travels in a vacuum with a speed of about 186,000 miles per second. Now, that cleared it up for everyone, I'm sure. Um, this made perfect sense. In light... You're pardon the pun, in light of that definition, darkness is easy to define because darkness is the absence of all the qualities that make light. Darkness, however, is not a real thing. It's an anti-thing or an unthing, if you will. It's the absence of something. And yet the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. At the beginning of time, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Prior to this, the only thing that existed that we know of was God himself, and the Bible describes him as light. And so God is creating something that runs contrary to in the production of light, maybe perhaps from himself. God saw the light was good, and he separated it from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning of the first day. The word light, the term light, is used in the Gospel of John multiple times. I I know at least two dozen times the word light is used in this Gospel. In John chapter 1 verse 9, John the Baptist is referring to Jesus coming in the flesh. And he says, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And so he identifies Jesus as this light. And when you go back to the text that Travis read for us this morning, you see it there in John eight twelve, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks or whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so we get a a real interesting image of it here. Now, perhaps you recognize that verse as, if you're a a Shawshank Redemption fan, you recognize that verse as Warden Norton's favorite verse. Of course, he didn't live according to that verse or any other verse that I could determine. But we have this setting here that's prior in the first 11 verses and the the end of uh, chapter 7 of of John that... um, It's kind of interesting because we see that uh, Jesus is uh, dealing with this woman who was caught in adultery, and and it just doesn't seem to fit. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of weeks, but that that story about the woman caught in adultery is just kind of inserted. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of historical background regarding this circumstance, only to say that when Jesus is speaking at the time that we have recorded for us here in John 8, over in verse 20, it tells us that this is uh, in, uh, near the uh, court of women. The discussions occurred around the temple offering boxes, if you will. And it was during the time of the uh, festival or feast of tabernacles, and it was also during a time during the feast of tabernacles that was referred to as the illumination of the temple. 
And so it kind of fits historically and uh, uh, logically that Jesus might talk about light under the circumstance of light. And so uh, Jesus makes this statement, and we want to take a little, a little bit of a look at it this morning and see uh, what he's talking about here. The first thing he says is, I am the light of the world. Now, again, we, we talk about this because we're doing these I am sayings of Jesus, and we understand that this is the name of covenant, the name of, of God's relationship with Israel that he uses, I am. And it always brings us back to this conversation that God had with Moses back in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. And the name was revealed only to the children of Israel, and anyone who claimed to use this name then or subsequently used it of himself or someone else was claiming divinity or deity for himself. And that's one of the reasons, and um, I guess a specific reason, why Jesus was so hated by the religious leaders of his day because he was claiming to be something that they knew he just couldn't be. But there was a promise made regarding the coming of light. The rabbis had declared that the Messiah would be the light. In fact, one of the Messiah's names used throughout the uh, teaching of the Old Testament and the, uh, the rabbis was that the Messiah would be called light. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 22, we read these words of speaking of God. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in the darkness and light dwells with him. And so when Jesus comes and he, he uh, claims to be the light of the world, this superseded any kind of idea or expectation that they had ever envisioned of someone that could actually be light. Now, in the, in the law of the Jewish mind, they'd always consider the light whereby men would walk would be the gospel, or excuse me, would be the scriptures, if you will. Psalm 119, verse 105 uh, is uh, the reference we'll come back to later. But Jesus is now claiming authority even over the light of the, of the writing of the Old Testament. And you just can't have that kind of thing. You just can't have that. And so he comes along and claims to be the fulfillment of everything that God has promised in the Messiah. And so he, we have this statement that he makes here. He says, uh, relative to himself, uh, as he thinks about the light of life, in the Greek it means both the light which comes from life and the light which gives life. And notice he says, I am the light and not a light. He's, I'm not a replacement bulb. Uh, all these other folks didn't measure up, and so, you know, I can, I can, I'm coming and I'm going to step in where they, where they didn't succeed. I'm not a replacement. I'm the one. I'm the one that gives light, the light rather, that gives life. And so no wonder this statement would have been viewed with such controversy. The world then was filled with controversy just like the world is now. Back then there were societal and economic and cultural and political and religious issues that people had to deal with, much like there is today. And this resulted in great hostility, just like today, toward governments and groups and individuals. And so Jesus uh, comes along and he makes claims like this, and the religious leaders of the day would, would just despise him for it. And, and let me tell you, what Jesus says here would be tantamount to having a nuclear bomb dropped on a place. Because Jesus couldn't have disturbed things more so if he had done that literally, dropped a nuclear bomb. Because that's exactly what, how they're viewing this. How can this be? You're, you're nowhere close to being the light of life. God is light, and you're not it. You're not him. Jesus says, I am the light of life. I'm the, I'm the real deal. I'm the one. And so no wonder, uh, I, I, I mentioned this several times before uh, since uh, I've been ministering with you. I'll remind you again that one of the first questions that you always want to ask about a passage of Scripture is this. What is it about what Jesus said or did in this passage that would make people want to kill him? If you could answer that question about a particular text, you can usually get to the meaning of the text because that's what's happening. All these things are just, they're, they're like building blocks, just one on top of the other. Everyone is adding to another one. So what is it about this that would make people want to kill him? Well, it's very nuclear, in fact. This is not something that you can say and get away with it and without it causing all kind of fallout. 
And so Jesus says not only that he's the light of the world, he goes on to say that whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Now here he interjects something that's really important to us in in this day and age as, as it has been throughout the history of Christianity, and that is this introduction to discipleship, if you will. He introduces the word follow, and that's the word for discipleship throughout the Scripture. And it has multiple meanings, and and they all play a role in understanding what it is Jesus is saying. The word disciple has the idea of a soldier who follows his commanding officer. It has the idea of a slave who accompanies his master in obedience. Or a seeker of wisdom who accepts his counselor's opinion about something. Or a citizen obeying the laws of the city or state. Or a student following the reasoning of his teacher's lesson. All those things are kind of combined, if you will, in separate uh, understandings of what the word follower means. But we combine them all relative to our relationship to Jesus Christ. We are, in fact, soldiers in his army. We follow our captain. We are slaves, and he is our master. We are seekers of wisdom who ask for his opinion. We are citizens of his kingdom looking to obey his laws. We are students who sit at his feet learning his lessons. And a follower of Jesus does all these things. And so this this sold-out following of of Jesus results in walking in the light. Jesus says, anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness. Now the implication is here that he's always going to be walking in light. And so that's That's the crux, if you will, of what it means to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, that as we follow him, we walk in light and not in darkness. Now, the world has a, it's just a state of darkness when you think about it. Um, Many years ago, when I was in, Janice and I were in college, we traveled with the Christ and youth team uh, during our sophomore years in school. And when school was out the next summer, then I traveled with the two other guys in the group and we did camps all summer long. We did 10 Christian service camps. And if you want to OD on camp, that's your opportunity right there. Let me tell you. But our, our leader, our evangelist, he had a sermon that he used to preach about the darkness. And, um, he taught, he always used three, these three points. He said, in the darkness, you might get hurt in the darkness. You might get lost. And in the darkness, you might not find your way back. And uh, he always used the, the analogy of going cave exploring, spelunking, if any of you have ever done it. And so uh, one, one week when we were kind of in a, between camps, we stayed with his parents over in Tennessee, and we went cave exploring on back-to-back days. And I got a chance to experience for myself what he was talking about when he was talking about going in those caves. Let me tell you, you can get him some spots in there that you just, you know, you just about wish you were dead rather than being in there. I mean, I got, I got squeezed in places. I got into a dark place one time. My flashlight went out. I mean, it's, and when you're in a cave and it's dark, it is dark. That's the world. That's the world in darkness. The world believes, however, that it's an enlightened place. And it creates its own ideas of light and darkness. And then it relies on those ideas that it creates. And then it lives on those misguided ideas. The world says we can live in darkness and get along just fine. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. This is right after Jesus had said that... uh, uh, God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. But John three nineteen and following, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what has been done has been done through God. Wow. Now, when we think about light versus darkness, I'm reminded of a quote from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones who said this. He said, we've tried knowledge. We've tried education. We've tried economic, or excuse me, political enactments. We've tried intentional or international conferences. We've tried them all, but nothing avails. Is there no hope? 
Yes, there is an abundant and everlasting hope. You must be born again. What man needs is not more light. He needs a nature that will love the light and hate the darkness. When you think about our world, we don't need more light. we got plenty of light. We just need a nature that loves light and hates darkness. Because when we live in the light, it gives us freedom and perspective and purpose and energy and, and uh, enjoyment. And stepping into the light requires something very bold on behalf of every man, woman, boy, and girl who makes, that makes the effort to do it. It sets you at odds with the darkness. And the darkness doesn't like that. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And then he concludes by saying, but we'll have the light of life. Yeah, you know, it's not just a matter that you, uh, that you don't get bad stuff. You get good stuff, he says. You'll have the light of life. Now, when we start thinking about the characteristics of physical light, physical light, you think about all the things that light does. First of all, light reveals, enables us to avoid getting hurt or lost or never returning. It enables us to find things that we might be looking for. Light reveals things, doesn't it? Light also gives life. It enables all life to exist and to grow. Nothing would grow without light. Light gives warmth. I read that a, in an igloo, if you inside an igloo that's 32 degrees, you can light one candle and within a half hour or so, it's 45 degrees inside that igloo. Isn't that something? In case y'all think we need an igloo today, okay? Uh, I'd like to have one personally, but light gives guide, provides guidance. Think of how many ways light is used for the purpose of guiding us so that we don't get injured or something. Light scatters darkness. When a light is turned on in any room, the darkness moves away, doesn't it? And so all those are kind of the physical characteristics of light. But what about the characteristics of spiritual light? The same things apply. Light reveals. When you have spiritual enlightenment, something new has been revealed to you that you can live by. C.S. Lewis, the great theologian, said, I believe in Christ like I believe in the sun, not only because I see it, but by because, uh, because by it all things are seen. So it's not just a matter of looking at the sun, saying the sun's there. Because the sun's there, everything else is, is lightened up. Light reveals. Light gives life. John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. His life came to enlighten us so that we can in, uh, enjoy our lives. Light gives warmth. Ecclesiastes eleven seven 7 says, light is sweet and pleases the eyes to see the sun. Light provides guidance. That psalm I mentioned earlier, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Spiritual light scatters darkness. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now, I don't spend just a second with that verse. You might want to turn to it in unline or something. I don't know. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. Now, the King James Version says the darkness has not comprehended it. Okay? The actual word that's used there can not only mean understood or comprehend, it also can mean overcome so the light that he's talking about there, the light of Jesus Christ, not only that the darkness could not understand it or comprehend it, the darkness can't overcome it no matter how it tries. And I know that sometimes we look around and we think the darkness has overcome the light, but it has not. The light still shines as brightly as it ever has. The problem is men and women and boys and girls around the world, many of them just don't want to acknowledge it. Well, what does all this mean for us? Let's pull all this together and see if we can end up somewhere. What does all this mean for us? Well, first of all, it means we should pay attention to Jesus' claim to be the light of the world. But we ought to pay attention to that. If he claims that, and we see all these qualities and characteristics of this light, then we need to pay attention to that. First, first John 1 John 1.5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. John 14, excuse me, John 12, 46. 
Jesus says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now, think about it just for a moment. Just for a moment. I you can walk down this lane, this, this path in your, uh, you know, when you leave here. But think about how your lives, our lives, have been enlightened and enriched by virtue of walking in the light of Jesus. All the things that we've avoided, all the things that could have trapped us and, and made life miserable and caused us all kind of difficulties and troubles that we have avoided because we've walked in the light. Uh, I think about, uh, when I was in college, I wrote a, wrote a paper one time for a class. It was a creative writing class. And I wrote a paper as if I had gone to another school and, and majored in another topic or subject, you know, and, and how my life might have turned out. Think about that. Think about it just for a second. In addition to the fact that we should pay attention to Jesus' claim that he is the light of the world, we should respond to Jesus' claim that he is the light of the world. And there are three things, three ways that we do that and three things we ought to do. The first one is, obviously, is to follow him. Now, I realize that most of us in here have done that. This is the chief command that, uh, of a disciple of Jesus. This is the first thing that we have to do if we're going to, if we're going to be who he claim, wants us to be, and that is that we follow him. The second thing is that we have to hate the darkness. We have to hate evil. Not just, you know, kind of wink and nod at it. It's got to be something that we hate. This is the quality. The hatred of darkness is the quality which determines how faithful we will be in our discipleship. Because if we start making allowances for the darkness and winking and nodding at it, then we're not going to be as faithful as we need to be. So we need to follow him. We need, we need to hate the darkness. And thirdly, we need to walk in light. This is the quality which determines how effective we will be in our discipleship. It's one thing to ha- hate the darkness. We can all sit around and curse the darkness. But we have to walk in the light in order to be effective. Now, Jesus did not come into the world to judge the world. He tells us that in John three seventeen. I didn't come into the world to judge the world or to condemn it. I came to save it. People, however, judge themselves when they refuse to turn from spiritual darkness and respond to the light. They're judging themselves. And when we think about Jesus as the light, people can look around to him and try to judge him all day long, and it just doesn't work. William Barclay tells the story of a visitor who was being shown around the art gallery by one of the attendants. And in the gallery were a lot of masterpieces by uh, some of the great uh, painters beyond price and possessions and uh, a, a beauty and unquestioned genius. And at the end of the tour, the visitor said, well, I don't think much of your old pictures. And the attendant answered very quietly, sir, I would remind you that these pictures are no longer on trial. (laughs) But those who look at them are. Jesus is no longer on trial. Jesus is the light of the world. It's those of us who are looking at him who are on trial. We're the ones that are being held up against the light to see whether or not we're where we're supposed to be and doing what we're supposed to do. And as I mentioned earlier, I know this, you know, as we think about this group gathered here today, all of us, we wouldn't be here today if, if we weren't uh, who we claim to be, I don't think. But it's easy for us. It's easy for us, if we're not careful, to kind of, you know, let the light fade in some area of our lives or not follow it in some other area of our lives. And it's easy for, for us not to hate the darkness like we need to, or to walk in the light as we ought to. And someone here today that may be struggling with that, we're going to sing a hymn of decision. If you have a public decision to make, we encourage and we invite you to do that. But for the rest of us, all of us, <laughs> because none of us are above some measure of hypocrisy, great or small, in our lives somewhere where we just don't measure up. And And Jesus is calling us back to that light, which is he himself. Stand with me. We're going to sing.